Hi biologists, let's start by looking at the learning objectives for this lesson. These objectives pertain to the higher level paper only. At the end of this section and following the biology syllabus, you should be able to outline the variables in predator-prey relationships, describe the effect of war, famine, contraception and disease on the human population. What does this actually mean? What are we trying to understand? For the higher level paper, you need to be able to describe the variables or the factors involved in predator-prey interactions. And also, straightforwardly enough, you need to be able to describe the effects of war, famine, contraception and disease on human population numbers. Let's battle on. We're going to approach the learning of our ecology definitions or ecology terms like you would approach the learning of a new language. When you learn a new language, you have to learn your vocabulary. When you know your vocabulary, you can put it together and speak the language. The same thing here. When you learn your ecology definitions, you can put them together and then you can speak the language of ecology. It is vital to learn your definitions, therefore, and make sure you understand what they mean. Population dynamics. We have to try and understand what this means. Well, dynamics are the factors which stimulate growth, development or change within a process. So when we are studying population dynamics, we are studying the factors or the things that cause population numbers to change. Before we can study these factors, we have to appreciate the fact that the numbers of predators and prey are interrelated. Remember, praying for mercy because you're the organism getting eaten. They also show repeated cycles of rising and falling numbers. This pattern is best understood by looking at a graph. This graph is vitally important to understand. The first thing to notice is that we are plotting population size up the side versus time along the bottom. Now, as the number of prey rises, as the number of prey builds up, then the number of predators will rise as well. This makes sense because there's more food to go around. However, this will result in prey number falling because more of the prey is being killed and so their numbers will fall. This in turn will cause predator number to fall. This will result in fewer predators. This makes sense because there's less food to go around. Eventually, because the predator number has fallen, the numbers of prey will begin to rise again, starting the cycle once more. There are a number of other points that have to be learned from this graph. The first inference that you can draw is that the number of prey is always higher. The height of the graph, the height of the curve, is always higher than the number of predators. This is because the number of organisms get less as you go up the pyramid of numbers. There's always more prey at the bottom of the food chain compared to the predators who are at the top. The other point to notice here is that the maximum for the predators always follows in time the maximum for the prey. This again makes logical sense because you have to have a maximum prey first before maximum predators can be supported.
So in a nutshell, there are a number of important points to bear in mind regarding the predator-prey relationships. As the number of prey rises, predator number will rise. We're on the up and up. More prey will be killed and so the prey number will fall. This means less predators and so the predator number will fall. So both of us are on a downer. Eventually, prey number rises and the cycle starts again. Now we're in a position to consider the factors, the contributory factors, to consider the things involved in predator-prey relationships. The relationship between predators and prey and this delicate balance depends on the availability of food, concealment or camouflage plays a part, and there might be movement to a more abundant location. Let's look at these in turn. Food availability. This is an important factor that contributes to predator-prey interactions. A large number of prey can cause an increase in the number of predators. As the prey is killed off, however, there is less food for the predators, and so the predators will decline or die. Here in our example here, we have three rabbits able to support one fox in the neighborhood. If the rabbits breed like rabbits, then there will be enough to support another predator. Now we have predators that are going to eat the rabbits. So as the rabbits get wiped out, there is only enough to support less predators and they will then die. Concealment or camouflage, another factor that contributes to predator-prey interactions. Now the prey are always prevented from being totally wiped out and killed off. When their numbers are low, they are able to camouflage themselves so the predators can no longer find them so easily. This will allow a small population of the prey to survive and this will be enough to allow the prey to re-establish themselves and start to increase again. So in our example here, we have our green fly running for cover and able to camouflage themselves due to their green colour. Movement of predators. If the number of prey is so small that the predator cannot catch enough food to survive, the predators might move to a location where the prey is more ab abundant. If the prey is more abundant or more numerous, this will allow the prey in the old location to increase. It is this balance between all these factors that results in a repeated pattern or a repeated cycle of change according to the graph we already looked at in the numbers of predators and prey. Now let's turn our attention to the population of humans. Since the beginning of mankind the number of humans has increased slowly. It even dipped in the 1600s due to all the people who died in the plague. However, since the 1950s, the number of humans in the world has grown very fast and has now reached 7 billion. This rapid increase in population is often called the population explosion. It is caused by reduced death rates. In other words, people are staying alive longer. Remember, population numbers always have to be related back to birth rates and death rates. Now, however, we must understand the point that even though the population number is rising, all the time, the rate 
or how fast it is rising, is slowing down, as the birth rate is declining in many countries. Some of the factors that affect human population numbers are war, famine, contraception, disease control. We will talk about each one of these in turn. War. Human population numbers are reduced because of the number of people killed in the war. Remember, you must relate it back to birth rate or death rate. Now, war is followed by an increased birth rate. You might have heard of the baby boomers. These are people who were born in the years following the Second World War. So in a nutshell, war reduces population numbers, but it's only a temporary thing. Famine. A lack of food leads to malnutrition and death due to both disease and starvation. Human population numbers are reduced due to the increased death rate. A lot of people dying. We saw this during the Irish famine. Contraception. The increased use of contraceptives has reduced the birth rate and the rate of population growth, especially in developed countries. Disease control. The use of vaccines, antibiotics, better sanitation, the use of insecticides to control diseases caused by insects have all helped to reduce the death rate. And if there are less people dying, then there will be an increase in human numbers, especially so in developed countries. Now that we've reached the end of our lesson, have we achieved our objective? Are you able to outline the variables in predator-prey relationships? Are you able to describe the effect of war, famine, contraception and disease on the human population?